Well, good morning, everybody. I'm going to start you off today uh, just with a quick look at something from Twitter. Uh, Elizabeth Lightman, I think that's how you say her last name, is a National Weather Service employee, and she works for the uh, Storm Prediction Center. I'm going to be honest, she is one of the best in the business. And when you think about the risk of severe weather, she's a part of the team that issues these forecasts from the Storm Prediction Center, which I show you all the time, kind of honing in on the areas of greatest risk of severe weather. And I just want to brag for a moment about how incredible our National Weather Service and their employees are, because just take a look at the graphic that you've been seeing here. Going all the way back five days ago, they had been identifying a region, this region right in through here where they had the greatest risk of severe weather. And then each day they modified that. Just as the new information came in, they saw the storm system was evolving. And by the time we got to yesterday, just ahead of this massive severe weather outbreak, you can see they issued a large area of moderate risk uh, for these severe storms. And then it's their job to monitor it and issue warnings, and, or excuse me, issue the watches. The local National Weather Service branches issue the warnings. But just to, for a moment, just to step back and look at how incredible it is that we had such advance notice uh, of the potential for this outbreak. Now, it was pretty nasty. Yesterday, there was almost a million people without power. Uh, early this morning, if we kind of take a look at some of the numbers here, you can see still in North Carolina, we're tracking over 100,000 people without power. But from all the way from uh, Pennsylvania down to Georgia, you know, this whole area yesterday as the storms went over, just um, we saw a tremendous amount of, of straight line wind damage. While this storm system will likely be remembered for the straight line wind damage, because right now the unfiltered reports are over a thousand in terms of total reports here. You can just see where these storms ripped through. I don't want to forget just the sheer size of some of the hail that came out of not only these storms here, but also the ones that were back in the plains. Now, when we look at the filtered reports, which will be the official number that goes into the database, we're currently at 625. That would put this above the June 25th outbreak we had this year, also above the July 28th outbreak, but one below the March 31st outbreak, which hit the Midwest. But just, you know, ranking these things is a silly thing to do. It's important just to understand the total impact of a storm system like this. So let's grab a look at it here. This was just as the sun was rising here this morning in the Northeast. So I'm going to take you back yesterday just to show you the size of this system. Now remember, the low you're looking at here was the one we talked about late last week that started off over Wyoming. It was that slow mover I said we'd be talking about for four or five days. Well, here it is yesterday, and to the south of it, just the atmosphere was ripe. We had the right wind shear profile. We had plenty of moisture. We had the trigger with the front that was coming through, and it just set off a line of storms here. You can even see late last night the leading edge of a pretty sizable squall line that rolled all the way down here into parts of the southeast. Now, as the sun set, you can also see just the size of the anvil on top of these huge storms that came out of Colorado, Wyoming, but hit Nebraska coming into Kansas. And many of these were hailers. On the northern side of it, we've got the smoke continuing here from both Canada and the Pacific Northwest. And even as the sun was setting, you can see some of the larger wildfires that are in parts of Utah right now. We remained uh, unsettled a bit in the Pacific Northwest, giving one more day here of, I think, thunderstorm activity. But as the sun set, it was the evolution of these storms as they got offshore and then the ones behind it moving from northwest to southeast out of Kansas into Oklahoma. You can see in the overnight, just as we about to approach sunrise here, where those storms currently sit. Now, one last thing I want to point out. If you notice, as I'm kind of getting to this morning, you see the kind of the swirl that's happening here. This is another shortwave that we're keeping a close eye on. That shortwave that you see right here is going to become a part of a setup that's going to drive storms right across this area for another couple of days. And we're going to see how much rainfall we're expecting out of those and also what the severe threat looks like. But in animation from yesterday and the radar, you can just watch these lines of storms ripping across the east. You see the large complex of storms that this morning is producing incredibly heavy rain and severe conditions down here in Oklahoma and Arkansas. And here is that upper level system we're just watching that's going to evolve over the next few days to become our next player moving across the country. I also want to show you another Twitter account. This is from the National Weather Service Eastern Region. So again, each of these being public, I can show them to you here. Um, this was um, some reports of some of the extremely large hail that we had in Virginia. So uh, obviously these stones are approaching four inches in diameter, and they did quite a bit of damage uh, throughout that area. I'd like to show you what the latest 24-hour maximum estimated hail size is. And we kind of zoom in here. You can see this, the, the, right in through this area, down here in Virginia, each one of these storms getting way up here into these, these shades means that on radar we were estimating maximum estimated hail size between three and four inches. Now you come back over here into the south, again a lot of these storms putting down a pea size hail, some quarter size hail out of this. 
but take a look right in through here. Uh, with some of those larger storms, these streaks coming across this area. And our central plains of the United States have taken an absolute beating this year with respect to how much severe weather we've seen, most of it coming from very large and damaging hail. But the last 20 or 72 hours now of total accumulated precipitation shows um, kind of all of these systems in play. So we had the mesoscale convective vortex that rolled through here. We had the deeper low that dumped all this rain that now moved into New England yesterday, producing the severe weather. We had the leading wave that came out last night, delivering all the heavy rain here, plus the hail on the back side. And here's the upper level low that we're going to be tracking as we go forward into this forecast. Now, when you look at this, I'd like to add it to the last uh, two weeks, but remember the next map I'm gonna show you does not include the last 24 hours of total accumulated precipitation. So let me just show you what this map does not include. It doesn't have any of this in it, okay? So none of that is in this next map. As you look at it though, we're still trying to identify those regions that are extremely dry. So to see the rains getting into this part of Oklahoma, expecting to spread into parts of Arkansas and Mississippi today, this is an area that desperately needs rainfall. We've had over a thousand percent of normal in this region and when I show you the upcoming forecast, that's going to be an area that's expected to get quite a bit more precipitation. In this part of North and South Carolina, now remember we had some storms that rolled through here yesterday, but take a look. See where this was missed in parts of Virginia and this section of North Carolina? There's a lot of agriculture that happens here. And if you just notice, this has been an area of the last two weeks that's been quite dry. So I need to keep an eye on this particular spot. But then again, the, the largest glaring holes are down here in Texas. They're in pockets of northeastern Iowa. You can see up here near the arrowhead of Minnesota and in this part of, uh, of North Dakota, which is right now over the last 35 days having its one of its driest stretches in history, going back 130 years uh, in this area. Then you notice parts of the Pacific Northwest and California. This is just an ongoing narrative here about where the moisture has and has not been uh, this, this particular year, to be honest with you. So early this morning here, and I was recording this kind of early, I'm on East Coast time this morning over in Indiana heading down to parts of Tennessee tonight. So pretty excited to talk some, to some folks there. We had the severe thunderstorm watch that was still in place here, but oppressive heat still across the south. We have excessive heat watches and warnings there. A couple of areas we're monitoring for flooding early, early this morning here and here. And uh, we have the red flag warnings that are still out for parts of the Four Corner states. So that next shortwave, here it sits later on today, and you can kind of see the overall flow that's going across the country. But you do note there are multiple low pressure systems that are still sitting to the north, and they're gonna to continue to move into this direction over the next seven days. So today's severe weather risk, this is the latest update from the Storm Prediction Center. We've kind of identified where that wave will come out again, adding another day of, of risk here for severe storms. And you can see that we're up in the enhanced category Again, the hail threat is high with these straight line winds and of course isolated tornadoes. Down here to the south, this is where we have a lingering boundary. Okay, from yesterday's system has left it right into here. So north of the extreme heat to the south, but the cooler air that came in behind that front, it just sits here. So we're gonna watch for severe weather down there. And next, I just wanna take you to day two because as that short wave, again, you saw it yesterday here, it's moving here today. As it moves across the country, we're gonna see the risk coming back into parts of Missouri, Southern Illinois, clipping parts of um, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee, the northern parts of Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and this side of Kansas. So this will be tomorrow that we're gonna keep an eye on this. Getting into day three, we're gonna watch that wave move over to parts of the southeast and the mid-Atlantic, and then we're gonna watch here to the north as the next front comes through, delivering chances for storms in this area. Now today what I'm gonna do is I just wanna add this up for you by looking at the high res name. Let's actually see if the 60, oh, 60 just came in, great. So as I play this forward, I wanna just show you, nope, went back to the zero C, sorry about that. I just wanna play this forward and just look at the total amount of precipitation currently being forecast by the model here. In fact, let me upload this again. I think it's my hotel internet that made it not pick up on all of the data. Well, anyways, you get the idea here, all right? Heavy rains moving through this region. Now, the shortwave comes out later tonight, dumping a lot of rain here. And then the risk starts to be increased into this area for the very heavy rainfall as we move into the day on Wednesday and Thursday. So this is what we're gonna be watching here uh, over the near term on the potential for not only heavy rain, but severe weather as identified by the, our forecast models. Now let's go to look at the upper level pattern because there's been a bit of a shift here I think we should just have a quick discussion about. As I mentioned, you have all of these little waves that are moving through the flow, right? And they're kind of coming in a trajectory like this in the near term. So playing this out through Wednesday into Thursday, just you know, multiple low pressure systems 
Now, as we talked about over the last 10 days or so, the setup man is right here. It's this deeper trough that continues to be reinforced over the Aleutian Islands. And to the north of it, we have some high latitude blocking. So this is up here in the, in the Arctic. So the key to this pattern is the persistence of this trough, all right? Because what ends up happening is this trough here helps promote ridging over the west, which dives low pressure systems in across the northern tier of the United States. So this is out through Friday, getting into the weekend. So what this does is it eventually sets up a little bit of a higher or low setup in the west. We still have our larger ridge tucked away from Texas to Florida. But again, you can see the flow coming over the top of it like this, which means just watch. I'll show you the animation in a moment, how many storms kind of roll through this area. As we just play this into early next week, this continues. This is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But we do see that out there about day 10, a little bit of a fading of that um, trough. So what this will allow to happen is higher heights will start to build in a broader area. And as that occurs, we're going to switch things up and allow possibly allow this ridge to open up. It's going to first open up into the west, <clears throat> excuse me, but we need to see what it eventually does to the cooler air that's kind of trapped into this trough here. So just playing this out there to day 10 and going beyond this, we're just starting to notice a bit of a fade. Now, could we be seeing model spread? Yeah, absolutely. But do you notice what we end up getting here? once we get out to that time period. So see how it's a little different? Some troughing tries to come into the west. Now, I'm at 300 hours in the forecast, and we know that the spread is very large at that, at that time uh, interval. This is all out there on August 20th. Okay, but I just want to keep an eye on this trend because if it does, it could start to spread a little bit more of this heat farther to the north because you know our narrative has been a lot of this area expected to stay cooler with oppressive heat in California and episodes of heat moving up the west coast of the United States. And what this does in terms of precipitation, well, if the lows continue to follow this direction, we keep having like short waves come out of this area, this is our wettest conditions. Uh, these are where our wettest conditions are, excuse me, and also into parts of New England. Now, the hole you see here along the Appalachian Mountains, I was kind of discussing this with my colleagues, Matt Reardon and Andrew Pritchard yesterday. This trajectory overall of the jet stream flow seems to be enhancing the rain shadow effect of the Appalachian Mountains, or the Blue Ridge Mountains here. And what it's doing is just on the on the downwind side of it, we're getting kind of a similar effect that we get off the Rockies all the time. So we'll watch this carefully to see if these areas, which we've identified already as being dry despite yesterday's storms, I'm talking about right in through here, are actually going to fill in. Other than that, we still identify those same holes as being very dry right in through these areas where the heat's going to stay on to the south and the heat's going to start to build into the western United States. I do expect if you get this ridge to open back up into this area, better monsoon will flow as well, but it's still not yet the full-blown monsoon that we can get. So I want to show you quickly what the European model is up to. And when you watch this, just pay attention to the kind of the, the train of low pressure systems that move into this area. Ready? So this is uh, starting off this morning. And as we just play this forward, going through Wednesday, there's the large complex of storms we're watching today here, tomorrow moving into this region. That gets into the southeast and into the mid-Atlantic. That's by Thursday. Next low comes through. There's that front that gives us the threat for severe storms here on Thursday. And then that moves through right over the Great Lakes into New England. And then here's the next one. See it? It was right through the country, delivering rain over the four corners, or excuse me, the Great Lakes, driving a front into this area. And that gets us all the way to Monday and Tuesday of next week. So did you see that? Watch it in fast uh, kind of speed here. Ready? This is the setup for the next seven days. And as that just plays forward, we're going to watch the evolution of the ridge to open up into the west after that time period. So to show you the operational European model runs precipitation anomaly graph over the next 10 days, these colors represent wetter and these represent drier. You start to see the story we just said unfold. From here, I would like to show you the latest probability graphics. This is, again, the next 10 days best chance of getting an inch. And again, you can see those drier regions that we've just pointed out here. In fact, to show them to you, this is the probability of getting less than a half of an inch. So this identifies those areas where we're continuing to look for those drought stresses going forward. And into week two, about the thing, the only thing I want to mention here is that we did see the National Weather Service pull back a bit on how dry this region is going to be. And I agree with that. You see better in the European model here, looking at the week two forecast in terms of precipitation um, anomalies. Now, in the tropics, I just want to keep discussing quickly here what's going on with Hurricane Dora. Like I mentioned yesterday, it's very rare to get a hurricane to cross the international date line. Now, one thing, I, I have to go look this up later. Um, I don't know. Do we reclassify it as a typhoon once it crosses the international date line? It, this doesn't happen very often. 
and I'll have to go back and look this up as well, but I want to say that one of the times it did happen in the past, it was actually another Hurricane Dora. So I'll, I'll go look to see if that name coincidentally has done this more than one time. This is well south of Hawaii, but still a major hurricane expected to be one, possibly even as it crosses the international dateline. Now, the other thing is coming off of Mexico the last few days, there was a tropical system named Eugene. And I just want to show you one thing looking at this precipitable water map. This would be the moisture plume from what was Tropical Storm Eugene. And I did not mention it yesterday because I was a bit unclear on where it was going to go. But there is a chance that some of the moisture from Eugene makes it into Southern California, which could bring in some cloud cover uh, and some rain. But if we look uh, at one other big topic before we go forward, I want to thank Ryan Maui for tweeting this out yesterday because I didn't know this paper had come out. But they looked at the uh, Tonga eruption from January of 2020, 2022. And uh, this paper has suggested that the addition of the, the, the water vapor load into the stratosphere, which remember, we vaporized like 450 meters of water. The, 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 the volcano was below the ocean surface. This is some of the first peer-reviewed research that I've seen where it suggests that we could be looking at, if you look at kind of this for a moment, um, the, the enhancement of our greenhouse effect by putting that water vapor deep into the stratosphere uh, could give us a feedback over the next decade in terms of global temperatures bumping them up. Now by how much, I'm going to read the paper later today. I think it's going to be very unclear as to just how much, but I want to let you know that there's been some ongoing research about what this could do to our global temperature patterns. Now right now, as we look at temperatures, this is what we've got. Tuesday's highs shown here. The color coding represents difference from normal. As we play into Wednesday and Thursday, a lot of cooler air sitting behind this system rolling through. The heat stays south where we have those excessive heat watches and warnings. Playing this out into Friday and then into the weekend, we notice that we have very seasonable temperatures throughout the Midwest, a bit warmer up the East Coast, still triple digit heat into parts of Texas. We know that early next week, Sunday into Monday, we're going to watch the heat build back into the west as the ridge starts to open up here temporarily. But if we look out there beyond that, the storm, or excuse me, the Climate Prediction Center still suggests that out here uh, from the 15th to the 21st, there is the, the risk of the heat being maintained in that area. Now, I'm going to call this into question, and they are too, okay, uh, as to whether or not the troughs that are expected in the models to come here are legitimate. If they do, then I think they'll back off on this excessive heat risk, but certainly keeping it down here south from, you know, from Arizona all the way over to Louisiana, that's certainly in the models. So let me show you what I mean. If I play this out here in a five-day sliding window of average temperature anomalies, there's the heat that builds in next week into the west. This stays on. The cooler air inside that trough is there. Heat stays south. Now watch day 10 through 15. You still see, whoops, sorry about that. You still see some of the heat backing off in the models across the west. And so that'll just be something to keep a very close eye on as we press forward. Last thing I'm going to share with you is yesterday we talked about the new updates from the European model looking out for the rest of this summer into early fall in terms of precipitation. Now this is just model output. This would be August, September, October, September, October, November, and then October, November, December. And one of the things I stressed was the risk because of the development of this El Nino of having drier conditions into the Pacific Northwest and the risk of having some wetter harvest issues for parts of our cotton belt into the southeast, maybe of the east coast, and possibly here in the Midwest as well. But we have some new data that came out from the um, National Multimodel Ensemble. And I'll link this in the notes below so that you have access to it because this, uh, you know, I have to pay a subscription to this site to show it to you. This is free. So this is our National Multimodel Ensemble. And its uh, U.S. precipitation rate for um, September, October, November looks something like this. And I just want to point out the consistency in the models at leaving out the Pacific Northwest from, you know, the, the normal start of the wet season here. Uh, wild cards are always going to be the tropical systems that could potentially form here. Remember, we still have better than 90% of this hurricane season ahead of us, but I want you to see that. And then I want to do one other thing with this, and you can play around with it later just by looking at the notes. Um, I'd like to go to the global precipitation rate, and we're going to click on this button, which shows us October, November, December. Now remember, we had an ongoing story yesterday that the start of, this, of the monsoon in Brazil could be delayed because of, well, what's going on right here in the Atlantic and the development of this El Nino. The Atlantic Meridional Mode means we do not typically get the strong turn of the moisture coming across Brazil early. 
but just like the European model, which was showing a drier risk here for the start of the next growing season, they were wetter in southern Brazil and Argentina as well. So that's been a pretty consistent note from the models. And as they continue to come out this month, I'll just show you the rest of them, all right? Hey, I really appreciate the attention, and we'll talk again uh, tomorrow morning. Thanks.